Hi everyone, I hope f food is good. It's wonderful to be here for the My Heritage talk and my ninth uh, Roots deck. It's becoming a tradition and I really enjoy seeing so many friends and friendly faces in the audience. Um, today in a talk that has become a tradition, I'll describe to you about new and cool things at My Heritage and especially new releases that were made here at Rootstech for the first time. But before I start to go into the technical details, I would like to start with a, a personal message. A genealogy is really family history, and family history is all about family. And I want to dedicate my talk to the person who inspires me the most, my mother, Sarah. This picture was taken at her study. She's a professor of Bible and she lives in that study and works 24 seven. She's now 85 years old, a workaholic just like me. And I think growing up with her and having so many deep conversation about, conversations about history and archeology span and Bible, and although she is not a genealogist per se, I think that it was thanks to her that I fell in love with genealogy and ended up making it my, my life's work and starting my heritage 17 years ago. So it's all thanks to her. <laughs> Thank you. There's even two anecdotes that are related to the formation of my heritage. When I uh, started the company, I named it after my daughter. So the company was called Inbal Genealogy Technologies. My, my first daughter was just born, but the domain inbal.com was taken. So um, I thought I would have to rename the company and I wanted the name MyHeritage, but the domain MyHeritage was taken. I called the owner of the domain and I spoke with him on the phone. He was the owner of a plantation called Heritage Plantation and he owned MyHeritage.com and he was very wealthy and he was not interested in selling me the domain and everything looked lost for my heritage. But then at the end of the conversation, when I felt that he was religious because he mentioned something about God, I told him, do you know, my mother is a professor of Bible and I started describing what she is working on and then I got his attention and we spoke for an hour and at the end of that hour, I had the domain. <laughs> Although my daughter in Bal never forgave me for that. <laughs> and when I started the company, and it was very difficult in the beginning, um, I financed the whole thing and my money ran out. Finally, I found investors and the investors told me that I need to nominate to the board of directors one person that I trust. And I nominated my mother. So for the, <laughs> for the first few years, uh, my mother, Sarah, was also on the board of MyHeritage, helping as much as she could. She still reminds me from time to time that she should get back on the board. <laughs> <laughs> and here you see some pictures that I adore of her and also of my late father, Gideon. So to continue with something personal, I want to share with you something that uh, no one has seen outside of my family. It's a special tribute that we prepared for my mother's recent 85th birthday. And the participants in this video are all my mother's children and grandchildren. And that's me and my three sisters and um, my mother's um, daughters and, and son in, sons-in-law. And all of us created, each of us created a special illustration and together we created what you are about to see and I hope you will enjoy it.
I visit my mother every week on the weekend and I cherish those visits and I hope that I will continue to visit her for many, many more years. So here's to my mother, Sarah, and your loved ones. Thank you. Okay, so now for the second part, uh, where I will describe to you cool and exciting new things at my heritage. And I will give you some color on that, hint, hint. <laughs> So our um, first project that was released quite recently, aimed to bring historical photos to life, is My Heritage in Color. I hope by now that um, most of you already have tried it and enjoyed it. And for those of you who haven't, I will describe what it is. For those of you who have, I will encourage you to do some more and tell you a bit about the story behind the scenes of how this came to be. My Heritage in Color allows anyone to upload black and white photographs, historical photographs, and colorize them automatically with advanced technology to bring them to life. <coughs> this technology is very sophisticated and it's based on machine learning. I will try to describe to you in a nutshell because it's quite interesting how, how that technology actually works. When you uh, take a photo that is in, in color, a color photo, it's very easy to convert it to black and white. That's trivial. But the opposite is very difficult. It's very challenging and difficult to take a black and white photo and imagine how it was really in color. But because it's so easy to convert from color to black and white, this technology um, utilized this phenomenon and was trained using millions of color photos. The color photos were then converted to black and white, scratched and faded, imitating what happens to photographs after decades. And then this was um, fed into a machine learning algorithm, handing it millions of photos before and giving it the target solution after of what it should strive to achieve because we had the color version to begin with. And this way, when you train the machine learning with a lot of good examples, it can then take a new photo that it has never seen before and it can say, ah, I understand. This is hair of a person. Now, the luminosity suggests that this person was blonde. So therefore, it knows that this should be a blonde person and not with um, pink with uh, green stripes. <laughs> Although it might miss out if you had somebody in your family with such hairstyle, such as Thomas. But <laughs> So <clears throat> this technology is not perfect. It doesn't know for real what was the color of your uh, Aunt Wilma when she attended that dinner. So it might get that dress color wrong. Um, I don't think it's the end of the world, but you have to understand the limitation of this uh, technology. We did not build this ourselves. We licensed this technology, we discovered this technology and licensed it from a startup called Deoldify that was created by two brilliant young people, Jason Antic and Dana Kelly. And in the final stretches, we were working with them together to improve the technology to bring it to what you can see today. The home for this feature is myheritage.com slash in color. This is where you can go to upload photos and convert them to color. But if you're using MyHeritage, there's also a colorize button anywhere you see a photo. And if you use our mobile app, there is a kind of color ring next to each photo and you just tap it and magically the photo is colorized. Uh, we encourage people to share the colorized photos because they're so amazing and remarkable. And that creates a viral loop because you share pictures and people are um, astounded and impressed and they want to do it also and that's great because it brings um, fresh interest into genealogy and more uh, young genealogists. So we allow colorizing up to 10 photographs for free and if you have a complete subscription at MyHeritage you can colorize to your heart's content. Now um, the majority of people we have uh, spoken with they, they love colorizing photos but for uh, some people, they don't like it. Now, I, I personally love black and white photos. I love historical photos. 
but that does not detract from my desire to see how they might look in color. When you colorize a photo, we do not change the original. The original is not touched and is preserved, and we encourage people who are sharing colorized photos to mention that they had been colorized. It's very, very important, so in the future, people won't feel that maybe this was the original photo, because the technology is sometimes so good that you might guess that this photo was taken in color, unless it was from 1885, and then you know that it was not in color. Um, but what are the main motivations for colorizing photos? Why is it so amazing when you see a photo for the first time in color, even though you've seen it all your life, a photo of your grandparents, perhaps? So first of all, it's great fun. And I, I think genealogy needs to be fun. It doesn't have to always be so serious. And um, we have to enjoy it. And colorizing photos is really great fun. It brings the past to life. Suddenly, you can touch the people in the photo as if the photo was taken yesterday. You can relate to them. And if these are people that you loved, that have passed away, it evokes very warm memories that surface back to you as you remember, because you remember your loved ones in color as they were. They, they, they didn't live in black and white. It also helps people notice details in photos that they had not been able to notice before. If you look at this example photo that I put here, that is all yellowish because of the uh, tribulations of time, and when it's colorized, you can look and um, focus on each and every object in the photo, and suddenly you look and find new details that you have never noticed. It gets young people interested in genealogy. Young people can't really communicate um, connect well with black and white photos. It feels to them as if it belongs to a different world. But when you show a young person a color photo, then it speaks to them. And this is very important for getting our children and grandchildren interested in our genealogy work so that uh, it will continue to the next generations, which I think this is one of the goals of genealogy. We don't want to take it with us to, uh, to our graves. We want to pass on this treasure to our children and grandchildren and other relatives. I've seen amazing conversations sparked over shared colorized photos, photos that would otherwise never be shared. And then I see all these Facebook friends come in and say, wow, wow, I've never seen this photo. Who is it? And so on. There's a lot of lively discussion, which is what I think genealogy should all be about. And it has caused some people who have given up on genealogy to, to come back, and it's great to win them back. So these are some of the great motivations of why colorization is so important. How, how did we add this to MyHeritage so quickly? At MyHeritage, we uh, encourage an atmosphere of creativity, and we have twice a year hackathons, which are really marathons, but not really of hacking. We're not evil hackers. Hacking in an urban dictionary is just to, to write something up. In the hackathons, we encourage employees to form any types of groups and teams that they would like, and to come up with brand new ideas that are not part of the company's formal roadmap. It can be anything at all. It can be about an amazing technology that can maybe scan facial recognition, or maybe better arrange the parking for the employees in the garage with some high-tech sensors. There, there have been many crazy ideas, and everything is welcome. The hackathon runs for about 16 hours straight, and at the end, we have a competition, because, you know, everyone is fiercely competitive. And in the last hackathon, that was just three months ago, um, one of our senior engineers, Maor, came up with the colorization project. And he was tracking different technology options for photo colorization, and he found something really good. And in the hackathon, he formed a small group, and they implemented a proof of concept. Of it. The hackathon is just one day. And the beauty of it is that there are many ideas, but when something is built, you can actually appreciate, is it something worth bringing to all of you and, and all the users, or is it best put aside for a few more years. And 
At the end of the hackathon, this colorization project won first prize. And I remember speaking on the podium, just like this, and talking to the MyHeritage employees and telling them, you guys have no idea how brilliant this is. I mean, you think it's, it's fun, but this is amazing. This is going to be used by millions of people. This is going to go viral. People are going to colorize their photos and share them, and it's going to be a viral genealogy feature, which is amazing. I don't ever recall, almost. Um, there have been very, very few viral. Um, I mean, we're not talking about celebrities here, but we're talking pure genealogy. So I told everyone, look, this is going to be amazing. And what I did is I put it at the top of the roadmap for the company. Then I uh, found by chance that the technology that we were using in the hackathon is being commercialized from an open source version that we used, and they now have something much better unreleased secret. So I managed to contact the inventors and convince them that MyHeritage is the best home for such technology, and we license it exclusively for MyHeritage. And then the team had one month to build everything for real and put it on MyHeritage and combine it with the mobile app and the website and everything that you've seen. And we really worked day and night over this with great enjoyment because we felt we were doing something fun and important. And all of that was released right on time, and it became the sensation that we envisioned that it would be. Here, by the way, in this example, you see that colorizing is not just for people. You can colorize also um, buildings and outdoor scenes. And in fact, colorization works best outside if you have photos that were taken outside because it brings to life the trees, the grass, the lakes, and it makes things even more alive. If you just colorize a, a portrait photo, then the face will be pink, and that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, so I encourage you to try and colorize pretty much every black and white photo you have because you, you will be amazed at what comes out. And indeed, it went viral. And before the first week was over, we had more than a million uh, photographs colorized. In the first two weeks, now it's two and a half weeks old, we've had 60,000 shares on social media. Um, that's far more than we're having on DNA. And I love some of the reactions that we got. People are saying, wow, it's addictive. My, my, there goes my weekend. <laughs> some people are saying I actually cried when I saw this photo in color. Um, people are showing these colorized photos to their family members and, and getting more information and showing them to children. So it's been really amazing. Very proud of my team to have built this in such a short time. Now, for the very serious genealogist, there's always a question of authenticity. I mean, what's going on here? You've taken a photo and you've put in colors that are simulated by machine learning, and they may not be accurate. So first, we are very upfront about it, and we tell everybody that th these colors may not be accurate, and that they could, should treat this as an artistic rendition of their photo, and not a replacement for the original photo. Two things I've done, which were really important for me when I designed this, to maintain the authenticity of the original photos. First, I don't touch the original photo. When you colorize, we create another entity which is secondary to the original. And it always sits together with the original, which ensures that when somebody can see the colorized version, they are one click away at most from seeing the original. They both share the same metadata, the same title, place, date, people tagged. So you don't need to repeat all the work of describing who is in the photo if you've already done that with the black and white photo. So the original is sacred, and the colorized version sits next to it. But I was aware that some people may take the photo out of my heritage and share it outside. So I, um, I came up with this symbol, which appears in the bottom left corner of every colorized photo. It's mandatory, and it is an indication that this was colorized automatically with machine learning, and the colors are not authentic. This, to me, is very important, and I've started a movement that will fight deep fake, because now the talk in the scientific community is that this will be used in other machine learning. There are, there are many technologies based on machine learning. You can uh, sharpen photos, and you can sometimes create fake photos. This symbol will be used by responsible actors 
so that users will know that these colors are not authentic. So um, the scientific community actually applauded my heritage for taking this responsible step and they said it's a great idea that they will also adopt. I encourage everybody who is sharing to be very, very explicit that this is colorized and I recommend to share side by side always the original and the colorized and we're adding in the next day or two a download option that actually puts the original and the colorized side by side so that you can share them as a single image. That will be ready in just a day or two. Thank you. This is a great example here on the slide and also I love what she wrote, Marie. You have to know I'm going to stay up all night using this, don't you? <laughs> but it's also a beautiful example and you can see the symbol in the bottom left corner. So what uh, is the, does the future look like with this uh, feature? The model is trained based on photos. So we are now working with these uh, inventors of the technology and giving them a lot of photos from my heritage so that they can improve the technology further. So you can look forward to better and better results over time because they call this partnership ideal and, and so do we. Uh, I came up with a novel idea which I will share with you. It's a secret but I decided to sacrifice it. Um, there are people who um, have the expertise to look at a photo and tell you when it was taken and where it was taken. Photo detectives, like Maureen. But it's a very rare talent and there are very few people with that capability. I wanted to invent an algorithm that would take any black and white photograph that you don't know much about and tell you when and where it was taken. And we're going to do this next. I will add a disclaimer that there is some gap between an idea and implementing it. <laughs> but I think we can pull it off. The secret sauce is that people on my heritage have tagged a lot of historical photos because people often wrote on the back of the photo when it was taken and also where it was taken. There are, there's a lot of metadata on historical photos on MyHeritage. We're going to run a machine learning algorithm learning with examples so that next time when you handed a mystery photo, it will say, I recognize that type of coat. It was popular in East Russia in the 1920s until the 1930s. So this is something amazing that I think would, would be next. And it would be helpful, I believe, to each and every one of you because I think almost everyone has these undocumented photos. They have no idea who's in there. They feel that it must be ancestors or close family. But if you knew where and when it was taken, it would help you bring you closer. And maybe facial recognition would be in the next step. So there are a lot of um, beautiful ideas that we want to pursue. At MyHeritage, we always have the desire to deploy advanced technology to help progress genealogy and we also have great people and a great team and the capability to build great things. So the combination of the desire to do great things and the capability to do great things will ensure that you guys will continue to receive great things from my heritage. Thank you. I want to move on now to a different topic which is brand new but before I go, this is my favorite picture of my parents taken at their honeymoon uh, in 1956. And this is how I always would like to remember them. In colorized, it's as if it was taken yesterday. And I think what they teach me the most is to love life. That's so important. So the next goodie I have for you is a wonderful, amazing, historical record collection that was released by MyHeritage today here at Rootstech. Yeehaw! This is a massive, gigantic collection of U.S. city directories that was built from 1.3 billion records. 
which means that almost every person in the United States in the time frame of this collection, which is 1860 until 1960, is included and in even multiple times. But again, you've heard it from me many times, uh, machine learning technology. We use such technology on this collection to make it better and, smart and smarter in original ways, which I will show you. And we also compressed this collection to have only 545 million records that are aggregated and high quality and smart. And I'll show you what this means and how it helps you as genealogists. Um, I think every one of you knows what city directories are. They've been very helpful and for centuries they've been published by every town and city to help people find residents and businesses. The type of information you typically find in city directories, names, spouses, uh, occupation, workplace, address, and sometimes uh, if you're lucky you can find trinkets of additional information like date of death or uh, other small treasures. But for the most part it's names and addresses and occupations and some people um, overlook it and think that it's sparse and it's not rich and it's boring. But in fact there's so much you can deduce out of city directories that is quite incredible. So we have taken for this collection more than 25,000 different city directories and they tend to be pretty big and thick. The city directory of the city of San Francisco is one hell of a directory. We've taken more than 25,000 of them, we've processed them and um, we released them today in one huge collection and there are thousands more you know how it is when you release something you don't wait if you have something good you hand it out and then you work on phase two and phase three so um, there are thousands more that are coming soon that will be added here you can see an example of what a city directory entry looks like and actually it requires a lot of expertise to understand these things the bottom entry says Bradley James D married to Mary H Tex WKR H what this cryptic line means is that James D Bradley Jess is abbreviation for James I, I hate abbreviations but they create ambiguity I hate ambiguity but these people wanted to save on the typesetting which was very expensive so if you take a book and every James becomes Jess, you've saved quite a lot of typesetting and a lot of paper. And the parenthesis means that it's Mary, but it's tricky because sometimes in parenthesis is the name of the business. So it's not easy. And then Tex is the textile and this is a textile worker and he's actually a homeowner and not a renter of this address. Now, you can develop extreme expertise in U.S. city directories, but we, we want to help you. So we actually take all that guesswork out and we present to you the original images but also the interpretation. We also expand these abbreviations for you but we leave the original and we leave the image so you can always check us. Like every collection you can search all of my heritage and it gets included or you can go to its search page and search specifically that collection. I think each and every one of you will find new information here and then you get the search results. There is a very interesting advanced search form for this collection where you can search by some amazing things that you would never have guessed that you can use in a city directory collection such as date of death. Uh, city directory is for living people. How can we guess when somebody died? Well, because we are tracking city directories year after year if we see two people living together and then suddenly one of them is gone and the other is described to be the widow of that person then we can pinpoint the date of death. We have pinpointed that even though a lot of genealogists do um, that themselves, they infer themselves, we help by doing it for you and we add that and you can even search by date of death and you can search by spouse. So if you had, uh, if you are cursed and you had a relative called Thomas Smith, which is, you know, the worst thing that might happen to you. Um, but um, he was married to Willamette, then uh, you can search for him and name the spouse in the advanced search form, and you can easily pinpoint the person that you're looking for. 
And you don't need to know about all the abbreviations because we have indexed the collection also with the full names, the regular names, so you can find everyone you're looking for. You don't need to guess that Patrick can also be P-A-T-K. We've, we've handled that for you. There has been very advanced technology. When we managed to license the books, I went to my team and I said, I'm not interested in you just doing a regular collection and throwing it out. This needs to be super smart so that it can allow genealogists to extract more value from the data. I challenged them to make this a super smart collection. And it took two years from the moment we had this until today in the morning when we released it. A lot of... <laughs> the, the applause should be directed at the result, not at the duration, but it's okay. <laughs> Thank you. At least you appreciate our persistence and efforts. So we had a unique challenge to parse the information so that it won't be just a free text OCR index like a newspaper. Because you know, trouble may happen. There's so many rows of people that if you do just regular optical character recognition, then it might take a first name from this row and a last name from the next row and create an individual who doesn't really exist. So we had to parse the city directories and understand what's a first name, what's a last name, what's an address. But every city has a different format. That's a curse. So en enter machine learning. We looked at all these books and we saw that these guys were cheap on the paper and the typesetting. And they used a lot of ditto marks. Sometimes they were even cheap on the ditto mark. <laughs> so if you look at the top right corner example, there is a surname, uh, Somerville, that is repeated but they're not even bothering to tell you that it's the same surname. We have to figure that out. We also have to figure out when a name wraps to another row. Otherwise, we might mistake it to be another name, but it's actually the end of the address of the previous record. Figured out all these cases to perfectly understand the records. Then, you know, machine learning requires examples. It requires high quality examples, and then it learns from these examples. Same with colorization. You start with high quality examples. So how did we uh, teach the machine to understand CD directories? We took each book and we took hundreds of entries and we gave them to humans to, to tag them. And to teach the machine, in this directory, it's last name before first name. But in the other directory, it's first name before last name. And here, this one does not have addresses. This one has phone numbers. This one has occupations. This one does not. It is learning by example. So we're using the different colors to tag what's a name, what's an occupation, what's an address, and so on. Then we let the algorithm run on the entire book, and we look at the results to see if it's done well. If not, we improve the training iteratively until the results are perfect. Do that for more than 25,000 books, and you get perfect results. And you can now add more books very easily. Consolidation was the biggest challenge that I gave my team. Some genealogy companies, they love to impress you with numbers. They tell you we have tens of millions of records, tens of billions of records. Uh, I think the number is less important and the quality is more important. So although I could have, thank you. Although we could have impressed you with a collection with 1.3 billion records, you know, I've seen in other places I mean, we are not the first to have city directories. We might be the last, but <laughs> I've seen in other places where you search city directories and you see some kind of, I call it kind of pollution of search results. You see dozens of very similar entries. So guess what? The person lived in this address in 1920 and 1921 and 1922 and 1923. There's dozens of similar results. I wanted to prevent that. I wanted to consolidate records that refer to the same person living in the same place over a span of multiple years so that I can present them to the user as one record, which then, as Randy Siever pointed out, is easier to source and to cite, because instead of doing that 30 times, you do it once. That consolidated record becomes more valuable because it tells a life story. Suddenly, you don't just see that this person lived here in that year, but you have a 20-year perspective over this person. You see how they changed jobs. 
Our algorithm was smart enough to consolidate even when the person changed jobs or changed spouse. <laughs> and many were replaced over the years. So you get a consolidated record that shows you the person. In this example, we have a Joseph Michael. In the original record, showed, showed on the slide on the bottom left, he is uh, last name Michael and first name J-O-S, Joseph. And he is married to Anne. But as we consolidate these, we find that towards the end, he changed spouse. And now he is with another spouse. Hence, we can determine the implicit time when uh, he married the second one, because it's between the first occurrence of the second one and the last occurrence of the first one. So as you can see here, I don't know if you can see it in the um, small print, but um, we imply events in these consolidated records. Now, we do allow you to click each individual entry that was consolidated and see the image and see the info. You do not lose anything whatsoever. We just make life easier for you and give you fewer records to deal with, but those records are richer. So from something that would appear dull to some people, you get a rich biography almost. We also handle these tough abbreviations for you. Every city directory has multiple pages of an abbreviation index. We have key keyed them from 25 plus thousand books so that you would have those abbreviations. We are also sharing smarts among. So if there is an abbreviation that was not in the book, we can deduce it from another book unless it's ambiguous and then we won't try to touch it. So most likely if you have a descriptive record of this Jason married to Elizabeth who was a warehouse man, and you don't know what is WHSE man, we, we tell you. We expand all these abbreviations for you. Make it very easy and help you find what you're looking for. We also imply death events. In this example, we have Elmer Abbott, and he's living in the same place for, for decades, for more than 30 years. At some point, he gets married. This is in 1933, the spouse Annie appears. And uh, you can see her, and she's a widow of Elmer. So from this, we deduce that he died between 1938 and 1943. And you could have done it yourself, but we make it easier for you. And you can now find this record if you are searching by death, by a death date. These are very accurate. I'll give you an example. The famous inventor, um, Thomas Edison is shown here with an implicit death date um, between 1930 and 1932. And it turns out that he indeed died in October 1931. So the city directory allowed us to home in on a period of about two years to locate his, his, his death. This is a Wikipedia entry, by the way. Another great thing you can do is you can search by who else lived in the same address, because this collection is searchable by address. Now, I really encourage you to try this trick. I'll give you an example. Here we have a James Jaffet, and he's living in a certain place in Texas, and there is a quick link that we give you right on the record. See who else who lived at this address. You click it and we run a search on that address. Now, James is known to be uh, married to Glenna L. When we search by this address, a third record surfaces, and this is Laverne Jaffet. We would not have found it probably if we had not done this kind of search. Now, Laverne might be the middle name of Glenna, or it might be another wife. You could try these two theories, but this has opened a new uh, avenue of research for you that you might not have noticed. Now, often people lived in the same place and you can find the descendants who have inherited maybe 20 or 30 years down. You can find the people who are living there. So take note of these names. You can go back in time. Maybe you can find in an older directory the ancestors of the person still living in the same address. So I always encourage you to use this very simple one-click 
uh, approach to see who else researched in the, uh, lived in the same address where you located your family. And then um, save this to your family trees and note down the address. Because when a person has an address on MyHeritage, we have pretty cool um, matching with newspapers. And we can take the address and the name and actually find relevant newspaper articles for you just based on that. So you can begin with the city directory. Thank you. You can begin with the city directory and um, add the address, find descendants or ancestors, and then find stories about this person that may have been published in local newspapers. So to summarize, uh, this is a beautiful collection of city directories. We think it's the best that you can find anywhere. I hope it was worth all this effort. I encourage you to make good use of it. I think each and every one of you is going to get value out of this collection. We want to continue and add more city directories uh, because this collection is by no means complete. We are going to add thousands of more directories that include more years, older than 1860 and newer than 1960. This is useful also as a, uh, uh, as a census supplement because the censuses were done every 10 years and uh, in some case five years. You can catch the in-between. You can catch events that you missed in the census completely if you're looking just from 10 years apart. The 1890 census was almost fully destroyed. We calculated that we can give you maybe 88% of its contents here in this collection. But um, one last thing I would like you to keep in mind and remember is that technologies that are used here are not perfect, they are never perfect. You will encounter mistakes in the optical character recognition, typos, sometimes maybe in the uh, consolidation, if you encounter a mistake, we encourage you to fix, to fix it because uh, in every record on MyHeritage, there is a feature where you can make corrections. If you use it, the technology will only get better. So please use it when you can, and please be tolerant to mistakes, and please make full use of this to break through any brick walls. Thank you. Okay, uh, last but not least for today, uh, a brief topic that is um, very powerful and useful. And we announced it yesterday here at Rootstech. This is the family tree fan, fan view. And it's not about uh, each of you having fans, but it's because of the fan chart. The fan view is in fact an interactive dynamic view of your family tree that looks like a fan chart. In the middle you see the root person that you select and it could be yourself. And then in these rings you see the parents, grandparents and so on for many generations. This is a very convenient and compact view that is probably one of the most compact views you can mathematically get. It's very nice to zoom in on a person and see all their ancestors at a glance. And once you get used to the colors if you get used to knowing that the paternal side is in a certain hue or color, your eye can go directly to that area and you don't have to look around. This is the text mode version of the fan view that has the names and, and the dates and everything here is interactive. You can click any person to get more information. In one click you can switch and make that person the root of the fan view you can click the plus buttons and add more ancestors that are missing right here. This is a working environment. This is not just a chart that you can print. We've also made it into a very beautiful and shareable object and we call this color mode. I have to say I was inspired by the beautiful work done at DNA Painter when I did this by Johnny Pearl. And here you see your ancestors, but it takes away the names. And this is easier for sharing because sometimes you don't want to share all these details about your family members or ancestors. 
But this is also great for something that genealogy is like, which is to show off some, from time to time about how uh, extensive your research is and how thorough and complete your research is. So you can take, I mean, for some of you here, 10 generations are not enough. It's, it's complete. Um, and for those less fortunate, it shows you which areas can use more research. So I looked at mine and it gave me renewed uh, vigor to go back to that brick wall because, you know, there is a gap in my color mode fan view and I, do, I want to fix that gap. <laughs> this is great for sharing also. You can take this image and we give you the facility to easily share it. I'll show that in a moment. And we give you a selector in the top right corner of the tree to switch between the four views of the tree that we now have. The regular mode, which we call family view, the pedigree, which is sideways for ancestors, list view, which is a list, a textual list, and now this new fan view. So you can switch from one to the other. And I really encourage you to use this when you're looking at your DNA matches. You can look at their tree, switch to fan view and see the ancestors really conveniently, which can be helpful. Also for the DNA folks here. You can show up to 10, ten generations. If you have a gigantic uh, desktop screen at home, you can really enjoy it because your entire ancestral line on one screen. And this is the share button. You can share to Facebook, Twitter, uh, WhatsApp, and you can download the image and you can share it by email if you wish. Later, we might add sharing of the text mode also if you want to share all the information as well, maybe even as a, a PDF. You share it, it comes out on Facebook looking hot. So I encourage all of you to give it a shot and share it with your many fans. <laughs> you got me. There's also a beautiful person panel on the left. So you click any person in the fan view and you see all the details of this person, especially details that the fan view won't show you, such as spouses and children, uh, siblings, and so on, um, and, and life events. And from here, you can easily reach the profile or edit the information and make corrections. So this is very interactive. This person panel, you might recognize it from our online tree in its regular family view. You can use that also in the color mode. And this is how it looks on iPad. It looks great. And on a smartphone, it's been optimized. It's coming soon to the mobile app of MyHeritage. And in our pedigree view, we've facelifted the interface and make it a bit nicer. And you see on the left, the same person panel looking great and being very useful. Needless to say, it operates in 42 languages that MyHeritage supports. So to summarize, um, the fan view is a beautiful new view from your family tree, great to work with, very compact, great for sharing. You can showcase how complete your tree is, be reminded where you can complete your research, uh, where you can invest more research. I want to thank Uri Gonen, who is the, uh, the person who built it single-handedly. Uri has been with MyHeritage just for a couple of years, 15 years, <laughs> and it's a pleasure to have him on the team. All right, guys, uh, that's all, folks. Thank you very much for coming. And anyone who has questions, you can walk up to me now, and I'll be happy to help for the next 30, 40 minutes. Thanks.